I'm walking down the street and um, um, I look stressed or, or um, like obviously avoiding people's looks and um, hoping, hoping, hoping they don't say I'm sick of schizophrenics again. Um, a smile. It can be that simple. It really, really can. Um, some of us are on the street um, and sane enough to know we need money to buy food, to eat, to survive, to live in the cold with, we, with a blanket that we have to put somewhere so that we don't forget where it is or whatever. Um, it, it all depends on what, what state of um, disrepair we're in. Um, There's other things you can do. Um, prayer goes a long, long way. Um, if you tell somebody, "Look, I'll pray for you that that you get better, that you that you have better luck." Um, some of us, that's all we need. I don't know. I echo Jude. Jude's response: just a smile or a hello can bring you out of your head if you're trapped in your mind and the voices are loud or the delusions are strong. If someone just says, hey, how are you? Or how are you? Or nice to see you. Or I've seen you before. Something like that really um, draws you out and brings you into reality, even if it's just for just a second in reality. And then you slip back. But just that one second is very powerful. I was uh, sitting here listening to Lindsay and Jude talk early, I mean before, just, and I was thinking it would be really good for someone like me to have heard them talk about once a month, I think over the last 50 years, <laughs> as uh, we become inured, we become casual, we have to protect ourselves a little bit, and uh, which is similar, I think, when we're walking down the street and there's somebody there who's disheveled and looking like he or she's in trouble. <clears throat> we often we look away to protect ourselves. <clears throat> but listening to Lindsay and Jude, I think it uh, speaks so honestly and with such raw experience. It takes away all my cynicism and <clears throat> in and all the uh, the skins I have grown around myself to protect myself from that. <clears throat> so once a month, I would like to hear them speak to me <laughs> or at another hospital and all the professionals working in the area. That's a tough one. Um, I, I've been through similar experiences with my mom where I'm very attached to her and sometimes I follow her around the house and she goes in the washroom and I'm waiting outside the door for her to come out and and um, I think just um, practice you know t time apart and um, and letting your son know that he's okay without you he's okay on his own and I'm not sure how to do that but that would be pretty important for him to recognize that he is okay. And um, I, do, I do know what it's like when you need to be with your mom because I've been like that where I need to be with my mom at all times. So um, right now I'm okay. I, can, I go to the library for the whole day. I go to groups. I, I, I'm out on my own. Um, to get to that point, probably, Probably what's helped me most is um, medication, and um, I hate to say that medication, mm -hmm. but um, and um, definitely um, just recognizing that I'm I'm okay on my own. Well, I had a baby. That's creative. <laughs> Um, I, um, at the age of 17, um, took a, a bus to Toronto to go to OCA. It's now called OCAD. Um, I went there with my portfolio, bright yellow plastic portfolio, and it was full of the art that I had done that year. 
um, as I became sick. And I went in, had my interview, talked to, I guess it was three different um, panels of people about my art. And um, they told me to wait for a little while after I, my interview, and so I did. And after about an hour, they came out and said, okay, these people have been accepted right away. And I was one of them. Yeah. By the end of that summer, I had deteriorated and my art was no longer coherent. I say coherent because it's the same as writing. If you have coherent language, then people get the message, whether it's good, bad, or whatever. Um, my art is now coherent again. And so although I was still creative, um, it was in a different form. Speaking of my creativity is, um, I have this rule um, that my mom made up for me. Um, I can draw something from inside my head, but then after that I have to draw something that I really see to draw me out of inside my head because sometimes it's quite frightening in my head and the pictures that I draw um, reflect that. So, um, so there's a little rule that draw what's in your head, draw something you can see. And, um, Wow. And I'm not a I'm not a great artist by any means, but I, but, <laughs> but I do enjoy, but I but I do enjoy it, and I enjoy writing as well. Uh, in a very strange way, health became synonymous with illness, in the way it's used. We suffer from mental health. Sometimes they add issues, I guess, to that. So really, it's, it's a euphemism. And I think it's ex so when, when we talk about mental health in that way, it would be like talking about um, bone health when what you really mean is cancer of the bone. And it really is in, a, in an odd, backward way trying to um, deal with some of the language that is so loaded, but ultimately increases the stigma. It makes the word in the history of medicine and illnesses, uh, the word cancer, for instance, was not used in hospitals in the 50s and early 60s. It was not spoken. There were a lot of euphemisms used, but not the word cancer. Flash ahead, now we have cancer hospitals and fun driving for cancer, and we have destigmatized cancer. So the funny way some of the destigmatization movements have gone is actually hiding the word and thus increasing the actual stigma. Now the words, many of the words become loaded over the years and we have, a, we have there was nothing originally wrong with the word retarded, meaning, I mean the word itself has an English language word meaning slow. <clears throat> But it became loaded with other uh, implications and associations and, and, and negative ones. So we do search for another word for it. Intellectual disability or other ability or any kinds of <clears throat> one of the, so a dilemma is if we hide the label for any illness, if we run from a name, then we are actually increasing the stigma. We're putting it in the closet and hiding from it. So, <clears throat> I mean, so when I, so I like to see when there, people are really talking about illness, the word illness. If we, if we use a euphemism, then we're actually increasing the ultimate stigma in the way we behave towards people who are ill. I would add one other thing. I was, I was making that point before. I used to say to people, Terry Fox did not run across Canada on behalf of bone health, right? <laughs> it wasn't for bone health. He, it was a remarkable difference he made, but it was for cancer. That situation can be very temporary. Um, try new things. 
new ways to, to create. Um, ask him to, 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 to draw how he feels when he's on medication, however ugly that might be, or however sedated, or however uh, frustrating it is for him. Um, I like the idea of, of painting something that you see and then painting something that's really there. I'd never thought of that. That was brilliant, mm. really. And it was. So, <clears throat> something mm. like that. For me, medication is um, very, very powerful. It's very sedating and causes fogginess and uh, it's very uncomfortable and I struggle with um, Com complying with the medication and taking it as it's supposed to be taken because it does damper your creativity but you have to um, sort of recognize that and step over that and into your creative self again because you had your creative self you're on medication medication numbs your mind but if you can step over that numbing back into the creative world then that's pretty amazing, and it's it's not impossible. Um, I'm not saying I'm creative, but I do enjoy doing artwork again. And I went for quite a while where I didn't do any writing or any drawing or any didn't even listen to music. I was just so so cut off and in in my head because of the medications, <laughs> which the po the point of the medication is to bring you out of your head. So. Yeah. My, my minister told my mother when I first got ill, he said, somewhere inside of that little girl, that group, the young girl, is the real Judy. And that just keep, don't give up hope. It will, she will come out again. She's in there. She's medicated, she's sick, whatever, however you want to say, but it's still Judy. Um, so there is always, always hope. Just keep, never give up and keep trying to, to find a different way to be creative. Yeah, that's absolutely true. And for, <clears throat> for that uh, specific question, and sitting on the other side of the prescription pad, it's al always a challenge to find the right balance. I think if I if my patient were functioning quite well in other ways, but was still, but, but was hearing good voices, or supportive voices, kind voices, I would leave, personally, I would leave that alone. I, wouldn't, I would not try to chemically eradicate that unless, uh, unless, unless he or she was totally caught up in that world and unable to engage with the, the real world. So it's a fine balance for just enough control of those symptoms without over-sedating, causing other major side effects. And it's a long process of discussion, negotiation. And I've certainly erred, usually the other way. When you have somebody um, with a mental illness, it, it varies from day to day and it's... Uh, it, you're um, you're upset, and um, y you you know you, you don't know what to do, and you, you think if you go to a psychiatrist they will help um, with the problem, or, or maybe they'll find a solution, but often that doesn't happen, you know, and and people go from psychiatrist to psychiatrist looking, and they have this uh, person a loved one who is suffering. And it's just such an incredibly difficult journey for many of us families. So um, my question, I think, is probably uh, represents a question that many families have. How do you find a good psychiatrist? Um, and, you know, I'm not trying to be a, a disturber. <laughs> but, you know, like, how do you do it? I mean... Um. My first psychiatrist was a very good psychiatrist. Um, uh, I had joined the Hamilton program for schizophrenia, and he was the head of that um, organization. 
And my family and I were sitting in a waiting room in uh, this hospital, and he came up from behind and he said to me, looking forward to seeing you next week. And I said, who's that? And mom said, that's your psychiatrist. And I said, he's crazy. Um, <laughs> transference. To be able to, to um, connect with the patient in a way that um, um, they, they can relax and just be themselves and they're comfortable to be as crazy as they need to be or as well as they can be so that they can get better. Mm -hmm. For families, it's really key uh, to, um, to have their loved one connect with a, a good psychiatrist. Uh, and that often, well, I won't say often, but that can, doesn't necessarily happen. And it's incredibly, I think the, the journey that many people yeah. do not see is the long distances that we go to and travel to find um, a good psychiatrist. You know, like, I, I, I'm speaking for, I believe, many people here. Um, you know, whether it's uh, one of the hospitals downtown, which is a long way away, or, or trying to get into the local emergency, which I, um, you know, has been difficult. Um, so, is there a way, in some way, that the, and it's not, you know, I, it, it's just that, is there a way that we can communicate better um, you know, is there a way that we families can sort of express our challenges and maybe we could work on a solution? Psych <coughs> psychiatry has been a, I mean, over the years, psychiatry has been approached in a number of different ways in medical training and then post-medical <coughs> training, specialist training and introduced, I mean, it's only in the probably 60s it was started to be introduced early on in medical training, some, including interviewing and, <coughs> and rapport, et cetera. Um, I don't know where it's going today. I, I uh, somewhat facetiously told my uh, niece, who's a family doctor, that she was, and very, well, I'll have to explain, that she's at UBC and a, uh, and a teacher at UBC and a family doc and very evidence-based. And I told her, you're the reason everybody's going to naturopaths and they're not going to doctors. <laughs> <laughs> it's wonderful going to a naturopath, the soft music playing and the promise of hope and we have cures for everything. and. And medicine has gotten more and more evidence-based scientific and, of course, more and more uh, digitized and more and more filling out forms, checking boxes, et cetera, et cetera. So I'm hearing, I'm hearing of patients whose experience is, you're the first doctor who's looked at me, but as opposed to the screen. <clears throat> so I'm not sure what <laughs> it's going in the right direction because... Well, it's going in the right direction, the evidence base, the science, <clears throat> that we try to do things that actually have a basis in reality and science. But that can take over, and it can be, and there are, and, and there is quite a bit of medicine, or a lot of sides of medicine that is moving in that direction. <clears throat> now, if for surgeons, I think that may be okay. When I went to an orthopedic surgeon, the first thing he said was, well, which knee is it, buddy? <laughs> that was the opening. <laughs> so that's okay. As long as he's super competent with knees, I'm, I'm good. <clears throat> Psychiatry is a little different. And, and it is a field where every patient is different. Every single person comes with a different story, a different set of problems, a different set of difficulties, different... <clears throat> um, uh, dif different difficulties, uh, telling, opening up, talking, et cetera, et cetera. <clears throat> I know when I went to uh, England for a year, so speaking the same language and working out of, in Cambridge, England, I had a family or two from the Fens, <clears throat> and they spoke English, I think, and I do too. 
But I thought, I don't have a clue what's going on after an hour <laughs> with this family. So small cultural differences make a big difference. Now they don't in surgery <clears throat> or some other fields of medicine. But in psychiatry, all those things make such a difference. And so one has to find ways of, of uh, bridging that gulf with these strangers in your office. I, actually, I have a method these days that pertains to that book. I, if nobody's talking, if they're all uptight and nervous and shy or, or depressed, I say, well, what do you think of Donald Trump? <laughs> <laughs> and I get a reaction from everybody, and everybody's immediately talking. <laughs> But it's, and I think the psychiatrists, well, it's hard to say what's good and bad because there's some very uh, scientifically uh, accurate, excellent psychiatrists who may not develop a rapport, but they're, as far as actual prescription of medicines, they're doing the right thing. And they might be doing it better than I, even though you like me better. <laughs> I may be giving you the wrong medicine. So um, it's I'm not sh I'm not sure where this is going. And with a, a strong anti psychiatry movement on one hand, pushing against it for the for the people who so there are fewer. Uh, if you look at the ages of psychiatrists vis-a-vis -vis other specialties. Uh, there's a great, great chunk of us over 60. And so we're, we're not being replenished as, as quickly and easily as many of the other specialties. And that's part of the, well, the stigma of mental illness, the stigma of psychiatry, because psychiatry within medicine has its own stigma. There, over the last, uh, I think if you drop back to 1967, 1970, 1975, you wouldn't find that. It would be accepted that the, this is a lifelong illness, even if stability is achieved and a high level of functioning is achieved, it's still a lifelong illness requiring perhaps not weekly, but requiring continuity with caretakers through the entire life cycle, if possible. I mean, people do move, et cetera. But <clears throat> uh, then a lot of work, but that's expensive. So, so a lot of study work has gone into things like short-term therapy, uh, consultation back to family doctor, et cetera, et cetera. And so the counselors, many of them are doing offering short-term therapy when what they really need is a lifelong case management with counseling. So that movement, which is uh, partly the professionalism, because people then are offering a specific skilled activity, cognitive behavioral therapy, 10 sessions, 10 weeks, right? And, uh, and it's cost-effective in that sense as opposed to something that feels so amorphous, case, case manager, counselor. Um, so there's a professional drive to have these defined, time-limited skills, activities that you give, and a, and a drive for economy, which, which mistakes. And I think behind it, too, is unfortunately the recovery movement which essentially um, does not recognize the, the long-term, chronic, lifelong nature of these illnesses. So there's a number of factors, I think, that have ended up with services being offered that way. I don't think it's right, but... <laughs> I was fortunate enough to have a case manager for 15 years. And her name's Susan Jancy. I might as well tell you all who she is. And she was wonderful. She retired. 
Um, during that period of time, I lost, well, I used to be almost 350 pounds. So she helped with weight loss. She helped with raising my daughter and then my daughter moving out at 17 and never coming back home. And she helped me stay off cigarettes. She helped me with everything. Um, so um, my husband, George, um, unfortunately hasn't had such good luck. Um, and it angers you to see someone that you love that just is not getting the kind of, of um, compassion that that you wish you could give to them, but know better because you're too close to them. Um, case management is very important. Psychiatrists are very important. My family is very religious and did not believe in, in um, the psychiatric system. So I took it upon myself to go into it and to get help and thank God I did. The world is a scary place when you have schizophrenia because you don't know what is real and you don't know what other people, whether they're real or what they're say, if what they're saying has a different meaning. Um, so the, the easiest thing to do is lock yourself in your room by yourself where you don't have to um, guess what people are thinking or guess what the voices are saying. Or um, I'm not sure how to get your son out of his room. Um, maybe just inviting him to a meal, like maybe if he eats um, supper with you. Um, I'm I'm not I'm not sure, but I I do understand that the world is a scary place when you have schizophrenia. So your instinct is to isolate and sort of hibernate by yourself, and um, and that can that can be scary. The the core problem with schizophrenia. Uh, are really those what they have labeled negative symptoms, but they're really they're really deficits or problems <clears throat> in 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 interpreting and managing organizing the important information around you, which is the social information. We're social beings, and the most important thing is knowing <clears throat> what this person means to me and is a friend foe helper, mother, lover, distant relation, <clears throat> where do I fit in, what's my role, what's expected of me in any social, and of course that's the task <clears throat> of adolescence to gradually figure that out. Well, who is my, what, what membership do I have? <clears throat> and, and I need a membership, I'm driven to find membership as a teenager, well as a child too for that matter membership of my peers, what's my role with them, do I fit in, am I accepted? And the very parts of the brain that allow us usually to do that, and when you think about how we do that, it's, it's, it's almost magical how we can walk into a, a situation, talk to people, understand who they are, what they are, whether I should use the F word at this moment or not, et cetera, just for an example, that I mean all of this is done non-verbally, eye contact, context. We read all this and we feel comfortable. Now, of course, all of us are not comfortable at different times, but generally that's we get comfortable and we find a place in that social world. <clears throat> and within that social word, world, we're defining uh, competence, all the sense of self. <clears throat> am I competent? Am I worthwhile? Am I loved? Am I lovable? Etc. Am I in danger? Not in danger? So I'm working all that out socially. The very parts of the brain that do that <clears throat> are struggling with schizophrenia. So a natural response is to not talk, to retreat, to isolate, to hide. All but from mother usually, because mother is that one constant relationship you've always understood, right? <laughs> It hasn't changed. So from a child before you develop the illness, 
to some extent father, but even more mother. So the one relationship you know that's still there, that still has the same rules in it, how do you interact, uh, is, is with mother. So with mother is usually okay. Not always. Mother can become an object of uh, worry and fear too, but, but usually mother is okay. <clears throat> so, so that protects your son from the agony and, and anxiety and terrible fear of being in situations that make no sense <clears throat> to him. Now when they, make, when, you, when, you, when they make no sense to him, his brain will have to probably make sense of it and that's where we get delusions. So, so see that as avoidance of situations that disorganize him, that, that frighten him. And, and pills don't do it. We don't have pills that do very, very good job of overcoming that. So it is a matter of inch by inch, step by step, going out with you, <clears throat> that kind of thing, and then seeing if there's a worker who will come and take him out. Doing one small thing, simple, easy thing that we all know the social rules of, such as go to the food court and eat something at the food court and come home with somebody. So it's social situations where the rules are simple and understood and not complex. As much as you can, but it's... Today, unfortunately, we also have the internet that, uh, that can substitute for that real world, which makes it harder to drag somebody out. And then we have situations where, and when I'm from the other side of the prescription pad again, <clears throat> a person's telling me his, his life is that, mostly in his room, mostly alone, but he's happy, he's content. So, and I'm at the other end of the, so I don't know, do, do I risk making, uh, giving him toxic medications to try to get him doing more? Uh, but in your situation, I think it would be inch by inch, step by step, with you by his side, to s social situations that he can tolerate. So that means not complex, not loud, not difficult. And see if you can desensitize him to that gradually. Well, I, I do think uh, there's n almost never a point of directly confronting or arguing with a delusion. <clears throat> the best you can do if you are going to engage with it is in interpret upward, which means recognize the feeling and reflect the feeling or the fear without accepting the actual delusion. And that sometimes works. So it's, it's uh, somebody's after me. You, I, I understand you're feeling very frightened uh, and that the world is unfair and you're being... So, so engaging as an interpretation of the delusion as an expression of a position of persecution, fear, loneliness, worthlessness, uh, somebody's controlling me. So you can accept that the other person is feeling controlled. So I don't know what the particular delusions are in this case, but delusions are never trivial matters. <clears throat> They're always about those major interpersonal relationships that we are trying to negotiate through adolescence and adulthood to do with things like control. Who's got control? My, I mean, how much control do I have in my life, period? Or is somebody controlling me? And is it, are you controlling or am I controlling? Who's got the power at this moment, you or me? How much power do I have? Can I affect things or not? So, and am I loved, not loved, etc. So all the major interpersonal parameters that we try to sort out 
<clears throat> through adolescence and early adulthood are the foundation of delusions. A, a delusional explanation of one of those fundamental parameters becomes the delusion. Same as, uh, in a sense, voices. Uh, they tend to either, they usually are bad. They usually are very negative. Mine were bad. And, and they, it's really the vocalization, internal vocalization of your worst thoughts and your worst fears become internally vocalized. The other person who spoke, with her, her son has uh, helpful voices, so well, but it's the other side of the coin that it's the it's the dichotomy in in our own heads. <clears throat> Am I good? Am I bad? It's, I'm guilty? Not guilty? What did I do that was wrong? And if you add some OCD to that, then we ruminate on it. So. My voices were very bad, and um, they were foreign to me. So once I w was established trust with somebody, doesn't really matter who, whoever is the first to, to reach you, I, I started to come out of that, that place in my head. Um, um, I realized that there was still a real world out there and that I did not have to believe the voices. If I still heard them, I could make the conscious choice to dismiss them as schizophrenic voices. My dad used to tell me, control your synapses. And he, I think he was half joking because that's impossible. Mm. But um, with, with mental illness, uh, there's so many different neural pathways. Um, and when you try to pinpoint something with your loved one, um, they often take a different synapse and they escape it. They escape the reality. Um, and I think that's the, the challenge with, with, especially schizophrenia, is there's just so many ways to get out of, out of the... the um, the facing of the fact that there's, there is a mental illness happening? Um, for me, my voices, uh, like Jude's, are very negative and very um, extreme. And oftentimes I feel afraid that people can hear what's going on in my head and that scares me significantly because then if people can hear these bad things in my head, they're going to think I'm a bad person. And um, I also struggle with OCD and uh, like what Dr. Dawson was saying, um, you have these voices and you have these delusions in your head and they just manifest themselves so strongly in your mind and they just go over and over and around and around and it's like you don't deserve to live, you're a bad person and the voices are echoing that and the, the, the thought is like it's, it's so overwhelming and so powerful. Um, so just, I, I agree with, you, with what Jude and Dr. Dawson were saying. I, I don't think applying uh, book, uh, the uh, cognitive behavioral therapy as a ritual, ritualized process would be, would be helpful. And with schizophrenia, we have the, the medication to control as much of the psychosis as possible with as few side effects. This leaves this leaves uh, us with the... I don't tend to like the word negative uh, symptoms, but that classifies them as a group of symptoms. They're deficits in processing information, and especially social information, which leads to isolation, withdrawal, pos paucity of thinking, etc., now, <coughs> therapy counseling, uh, a good counselor will always try to uh, encourage you to do what you should do and think the way you should think, right? Which is, I mean, cognitive behavioral therapy. Uh, 
So, so a good therapist, in whatever way he or she can reach that patient, should be, in, in terms of talk, encouraging within an accepting, non-judgmental environment, etc., to do the things you should do, and to think the better better ways. I mean, the, it's the, the glass is half full is cognitive behavior ther therapy essentially. So. Uh, no, they didn't all not like you, many of them, etc. So it, it's getting you to think in a, in a more positive, helpful way. <clears throat> well, that's good for all of us, really. And if somebody with schizophrenia has a, has a therapist who will uh, talk with him or her in that fashion, encouraging to do the things that are healthy and helpful, as well as thinking about yourself and the world in healthy, helpful ways. Well, that, and that's good. But the other half is practice, practice, practice. And that's the tricky part. The, the uh, negative symptoms are really deficits of information processing, social information processing from what you see right through to interpreting it, feeling about it, managing it, organizing it, I'm okay. This is my role within this group. I'll, I'll get the bill, I'll, I'll cook the hamburgers. What, <laughs> <laughs> uh, what, whatever group is organized socially, you find a role in it, you find a way of negotiating with it. The ability to do that <clears throat> uh, and the sensory apparatus and the interpretive mechanisms that you need to do that can improve through life. I mean, it's, so that skill can be improved. But with practice, practice, practice. So the question is, how do we get the practice, practice, practice? So that's why going to a cooking club is it's excellent. You're not just learning to cook, it's, it's practicing the other skills, which of course, frees up or, or in, improves the neural pathways as you do it, <clears throat> and you are practicing the very thing you need to practice, and it can improve through life. I've been around long enough to know some people with schizophrenia who are now in their 60s, and, and sometimes I can no longer detect that little bit of missed social cues it has improved to the point where I cannot see it anymore. And I've been practicing schizophrenia for a very long time. <laughs> Sense of humor is very important. Very um, important. <laughs> uh, we have a friend, George and I, um, he got better, well, whatever. You never really get better, but he, he's a stand-up comic at times, and mm. he developed um, a, a method called cognitive reconstruction therapy. And, <laughs> and what it is, it's basically uh, reverse psychiatry. And then you go from there, so. <laughs> I just want to uh, plug Home in the Hills programs. We do have, um, uh, we have Maggie Valth here up there. She's our program director. We do have uh, a cooking group on Fridays. Um, if, you're, if your loved one would like to go, we have two art programs and a social rec program on Wednesdays. So we do have some ongoing activities that keep people engaged, just to let you know. Reading is um, huge for me, and my ability to read comes and goes with my illness. Um, when I'm well, or weller, not, not well, but I can read, and you know when I'm not feeling well, when I can't read. Um, I, I can get easily obsessed with books. For a while there, I was obsessed with J.D. Salinger. I read a biography on him, which I felt quite guilty about, because the last thing he probably ever would have wanted was to have his life written out and here I was reading about his life so I felt guilty but um, his books are, are amazing. Catcher in the Rye, Raise High the Roof Beam, Carpenters and Seymour and Introduction, Franny and Zoe. Um, I read and reread and felt like I was learning profound 
things from the characters that he created. And he created the characters from real life. And um, I think that's pretty, pretty powerful. But um, reading is definitely huge for me. When I'm able to read, I know that I'm well. And, um, and um, yeah, that's... Reading is, is um, something that I've lost. Unfortunately, I'm, I don't comprehend what I read. So my husband reads to me, and um, <clears throat> I like to, to learn about um, what happened with the Jewish people in the Second World War. Um, I admire their will to live in spite of the worst conditions possible, and that gives me great strength. So George reads to me. Um, Right now he's reading to me a book about the benefits of not having your coffee ground at the store, <laughs> but grinding your coffee at home in small batches. So it, it's true. It's, it's much better, apparently. So I'm thankful for that. I'm, I'm a caregiver. My son has had schizophrenia since he was 17 years old. He's 31 years old now. And I agree with this lady. I, oh, I'm, I'm just so grateful to have my son. I feel truly blessed. And it took a long time to get to know each other because, you know, when a person has schizophrenia, sometimes he forgets who his mom is. But now we're at a great point. But. I want to say that you two are amazing. And I want to say that I admire you both. I admire you both very much. I'm sorry, I'm kind of, my voice is shaking because I'm very emotional right now. But honestly, I think that if people could hear you both, more people, there would be way less stigma in the world. And I think that, honestly, I, I think you have great strength, great courage. And you've said that us caregivers are strong and courageous. Well, I think you are the courageous ones, truly. And I, I would like to thank Dr. Dawson as well for helping us understand a little bit more the scientific side of things. And thank you for caring about our children. With that, Maggie and I are going to uh, present our panelists with uh, tokens of our appreciation. I think Maria DiCicco actually said it all tonight. I think she summed up the evening. Um, I think that uh, it was compelling and powerful. Can you hear me? Oh, compelling and powerful. And um, hopefully we can have more of these evenings as we go into the new year. Um, so I'd like to thank everybody for coming out. Thank you so much for your support, and especially thank you, Lindsay, thank you, Jude, and thank you, Dr. Dawson.